By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And in this episode, I have something special because we are playing EDH again, Elder Dragon Highlander. That means that I've made a deck consisting out of a hundred unique cards, well, except for the basic lands, and my deck has a commander. So technically, there are 99 unique cards and one commander. My commander today is Simbat. You heard it right, I'm playing with a mono blue artifact deck and I'm playing against Adam, better known as Mighty FP, and he is bringing a Soul Canard the Swamp King deck to the table. So that means he's playing with the colors blue, uh, black, and red. So I'm really looking forward to this match and to showing you these matches, I should say, because it was, oh man, it was quite a game. Now, before we go, to the game itself, I'm first going to do some deck tech. Now, if you want to skip the deck tech, no problem. Check the description below, and there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. So if you click on there, that will take you straight to the games, and you can skip the whole deck tech section. Although it is quite nice to take to take a look at the deck tech of this particular video because I've got beautiful deck photos of these two decks, and I've got to say, Adam, you also brought. A killer deck to the table so thank you for doing that um, so let's just go to the deck deck straight away let's start with uh, the deck of mighty FP let's go and here we see the deck of Adam now it's always a little bit difficult for me to try to analyze somebody's strategy with a normal deck especially you know more more so even with an EDH deck look at this beautiful pile of cards thank you adam once again for bringing it to the table we've got soul canard the swamp king there on the left ne next to the howl from beyond that is the commander of this deck and then i guess the thing that immediately catches my eye is that third row you see that red elemental blast which is going to be huge against me but also all that direct damage oh man this is going to be a problem earthquake lightning bolt firebolt disintegrate chain lightning hi <laughs> and even that fork he can start copying a huge fireball or disintegrate and call it a game also he has some counter magic there counter spell mana drain um, and of course, a card from Legends, Remove Soul. And that's a card you don't see often. It's, that's so nice about this format. When you're playing with single cards, other cards get a chance to shine. A Remove Soul is one of them. One blue and one. And you can counter a creature spell. And what, what I really like is that Remove Soul with Anime Debt. So if he has a well-timed Remove Soul, he can counter, let's say, my Mahamoti Jin, And then he can use his Anime Debt to attack me with my own Mahamoti. Now, that would be quite a play, you know, if he can pull that off. Other cards that um, kind of catch my eye is that he's playing with a lot of flyers. So I see, you know, Fallen Angel, Singer Vampire. Um, I see, what's it called again? Phantom Monster, which is just beautiful. I believe this is a beta one. Um, we also see an Air Elemental. Wow, another beautiful card. Perhaps the Phantom Monster, by the way, is an Alpha. I think it's an Alpha, actually. So maybe, Adam, you can let us know in the comments below. Beautiful creature. Uh, just beautiful to see Elf and Betas in general. Talking about beautiful creatures, look at that Vesuvian Doppelganger uh, that's at the top there above the Air Elemental. We also see a Control Magic, which is going to be quite powerful. A beautiful Sheevan Dragon. This is really a nice deck. Now, trying, I'm trying to look as well while I'm talking to find some combos in this deck. So we see a lot of direct damage. I think another uh, more combo uh, combos that I see in this deck is I think the Icy Manipulator, Nettling Imp, and the Royal Assassin. Now remember, Royal Assassin wants to see tapped creatures. Nettling Imp forces me to attack with my creature. When I attack, I have to tap it unless it's a Sarah Angel. <laughs> But I'm playing with blue, so I have to tap it. And then he can use the royal to tap and destroy my creature. So that's quite nice. Another thing that actually works is if he uses his icy manipulator to tap one of my creatures down and then forcing the nettling imp, uh, forcing my creature to attack with the nettling imp, but it can't because it's tapped and then it's also destroyed. Can you still follow what I'm saying? Anyway, that actually works. So that's also a combo you can play. Nettling Imp, a creature you don't see often, so I'm really happy to seeing it in this matchup. Another really nice uh, piece of synergy here is Nettling Imp and the Infernal Medusa. Now, Infernal Medusa uh, is a card from Legends, another card you don't see often, uh, but it's kind of like the Thicket Basilisk of Black, you could say. So that really works well, that Nettling Imp, Infernal Medusa combination. I think Fisher is also a great inclusion. 
And of course, we have the Nevin Neuro's disc, Larry Nevin's disc, Forticast, and of course, it comes into play tap, but then as soon as it untaps, you can pay one second and blow up the board, and that works great with those regeneration spells, so such as the Setch Troll and the Often Troll. Another really flavorful card in this deck, I think, is Sea Singer. Sea Singer is a card you don't see often, but it's actually quite strong. It's two blue and one for an 0-1 Merfolk from Fallen Empires. You can tap it to take control of target creature, but there is a big but. Your opponent needs to have islands. Now, he already plays with, with a Phantasmal Terrain to give me an island, but I've got good news for you, Adam. I'm playing blue, so you don't need to do that. I got you covered, man. You can steal whatever you want <laughs> with that Sea Singer. So when I'm looking at this deck, I am seeing a lot of threats for me, and I'm also seeing a lot of cool cards that I'm really, really looking forward to play against. Now let's take a look at my deck. And this is the deck that I am playing with today. And as you can see, it is completely blue and artifacts. And I, my commander is Zimbat, one blue and one to cast from the Arabian Nights expansion. And the cool thing about this little creature is it's a one one, I can tap it and I can draw a card. Now, if that card is a land, I can keep it in my hand. If that card is not a land, I have to discard it. Now, what I really like about Zimbat is it's cheap to cast so I can quickly get it out of the command zone. I can use it and if I need lands, because my deck is quite land hungry, mana hungry, like many EDH decks, I can simply use my Simbat. And if it's not a land, I don't even want it at that time. I will just drop it. And of course, because I'm playing with Simbat, I've tried to put a few cards in there that help me get cards back from my graveyard. Now, the most notable of that, I guess, is Draftness Restoration. It's a card from Antiquities for one blue and it reads, take any number of artifacts from your graveyard and put them on top of your library in any order. So that, of course, is great for me in the late game. So I'm going to try to discard a lot of artifacts with my Simbad, although I don't really have a choice because if I draw a card, if it's a land, I can keep. If it's not, no matter what, I've got to discard it. Talking about that, I've tried to kind of work around that as well. You do see a Conchhorn there. Uh, Conchhorn is an artifact from uh, Fallen Empires. It's two to cast one and tap and you can sacrifice it and then you draw two cards and you need to put one card back on the top of your library. Now, obviously, I'm gonna to choose to put a land on top of my library and then I can use Simbat to imme immediately draw that land, right? So in that case, I've turned Conchhorn into an artifact that is just giving me two extra cards to draw, which is not too shabby. Um, I'm also playing with uh, some artist proofs, APs in this deck. Next to the Winter Orc, you see an artist proof of the Sage of Letnam. Now, this beautiful art is done by Pete Venters. Sage of Letnam is a card from the Antiquities, one blue and one for a 1-2 creature that you can tap to sacrifice an artifact, and then you get to draw a card. It's, it's just it's such a fantastic card, and it works very well with some of the cards in this deck, one of them actually being the Tetravis that you see above it on the, I guess, on the right side. And Tetravis is a 4-4 flyer, and in your upkeep, you can take, uh, it comes into play with three plus one plus one counters, and during your upkeep, you can take any number of counters off to make 1-1 one, one flying artifact creatures. And with the Sage of Latinam, those 1-1 one, one flying creatures are turned into cards as well. So I kind of like that synergy. Talking about counters and doing tricks with counters, I've also included Tonus's Coffin. Now, Tonus's Coffin can do tons of work with Tetravis, Triskelion, Clockwork Avian, so I mean, that can really go crazy. And even if I don't have those cards in play, then Thomas's Coffin is still just a great little artifact to get rid of a big threat of my opponent or to protect one of my creatures when my opponent is trying to destroy them. For example, with the Fisher, I can just say, you know what, I'm gonna put it in the coffin, your Fisher fizzles, and next turn, I'm gonna untap my coffin and it'll return into play. Now, a, a minor thing to note though, is that when it comes into play out of the coffin, it does come into play tapped, okay? So that's something to remember. Um, there are a couple of other synergies. It would be, I think, too much to discuss all the synergies of this deck. Maybe it's good to just take a moment, maybe take a screenshot or just pause and just take a look at all these cards. There are a lot of little hidden secrets. Um, I would like to mention the Leviathan. I guess that's the last card that I'd like to mention. Four blue and five to cast for a 10-10 Trample. It is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful creature. Beautiful art. 10-10 Trample blue. The big problem is it comes into play tapped and you've got to sacrifice a couple of islands to untap it. And then when you attack, you've got to sacrifice a couple of islands. But you know what? I'm, 
I'm playing with blue. I've got Simba to get me some islands. I, I'm fine. I'm confident. I can do this. You know, it's fantastic. I feel, I feel that I can, I can make this Leviathan work in this deck. And yes, I'm also playing with a Colossus of Sardia because I feel Leviathan and Colossus of Sardia, they, they, they could be friends. They could be best buds. You know, they can relate to each other. Like, oh, I was also the biggest kid in my class. You know, I, I kind of feel that they could be friends. Anyway, enough jabbering and talk from my side. This is the deck. This is what I'm playing with. Let's go to the games. And we are off to the races. So this is actually one big game. So this is not the best of three or anything. This is just one huge game of EDH. You're taking on Adam's deck there with the beautiful Sulkanar playmat. Of course, I'm playing with the Timmy playmat. And you can see our commanders there on the table. Look at me go here. Turn two, Mishra's Workshop into an Icy Manipulator. So that's a great start for me. Adam playing his second mountain here. Let's just see what's going to happen. And playing an island, playing my commander, the Simbad, 1-1 one, one creature from the Arabian Nights that I can tap to draw a card. If that card is a land, I can keep it. If not, I've got to put it in the bin in my graveyard. And there's an obelisk of undoing the card from the Antiquities. One to cast, six to use, and I can uh, bring any permanent back to my hand. And I'm taking some mana burn damage here because of my uh, Mishra's Workshop. So I guess we're playing with mana burn today. I'm going to 28. And uh, let's see what Adam can do here. That's pretty nice for him. Some solid ramp with Felwerstone. Felwerstone, of course, being an island now because I have two islands on the board. That's not too bad for Adam because that is his third color. There you see an activation from my Simbat losing a, um, a Psyonic Blast. And tapping three, there is a Timmy, the Prodigal Sorcerer. One and tap, and it can deal one damage to any target. So that's pretty sweet for me here. There we see an island from Adams. Got five mana. Is he going to cast Sulkanar? He can actually cast Sulkanar right now. I think he's doing it. <laughs> okay, wow. Five, five, Swamp Walk, and he gets a life every time he plays or anybody plays. I believe he or anybody plays a black permanent. Anyway, I've got my uh, Icy Manipulator at least. Look at that, a Clockwork Avian card from Antiquities. It's an 04 flyer, but it comes into play with four plus one plus O counters. And when it attacks after combat, it loses one of those counters. And during your upkeep, you can choose to tap it and basically recharge it with as many counters as it has lost or as you want with a max of four counters. But when you do that, it does tap itself. So you lose it for a whole turn. It's uh, but anyway, it's it's a flyer now, which is kind of quite nice for me. Tapping down the Sulkanar, so that means I can start attacking next turn with the flyer. And oh, let's see what's Adam doing here. Tapping five again, double blue here, playing oh, with a Zuvan double ganger, and he's deciding to copy the Clockwork Avian. I'm gonna ping him for one here, so he's gonna drop to 29. And uh, wow, already quite an interesting game. Look at that board state. My opponent having that Solkanar and the Fazuvan, and, and I'm just having a lot of stuff on the board. So playing a clone here, probably going to clone the Fazuvan. And then the question is, what am I going to uh, copy with the Fazuvan double ganger? I think, uh, knowing me, I'm probably going to copy the Timmy. So let's just assume I've copied the Timmy. And Adam is keeping it a Clockwork Avian. So it's still a 4 4 flyer. Interesting, because he can also choose, nah, if he makes it, he cannot have two Sulkanars on a field, perhaps. I guess not. So that's not an option. Playing a Red Elemental Blast here to kill my clone. I'm actually, I mean, I'm not happy that I'm losing this creature, but I'm happy because it's hard to commentate with all these clones and Vesuvians, because I just don't know what's what. Earthquake for one here. Oh, this is, wow. This is such a good play here by, uh, by Adam, because I'm losing two creatures, including my Timmy. That's a very good move. And uh, Adam is dropping to 27 here, and I'm also on 27. It's kind of hard to follow his life total, but I'll, I'll try to keep you up to date during the match about his life total. But wow, there is a lot happening in this game. Yeah, and I need to put my Simbad back into the command zone and how it works. Every time it dies, it goes back to the command zone. And as you can see, it gets a counter on there. And that means I have to pay an additional two mana every time I want to cast it for every time that it dies. So right now it costs four mana to cast. Also playing a GM Day Tome here. That is pretty sweet. Only two cards left in hand. 
Now remember, I still have that IC to tap down the Soul Canar. What I really need is some more land. I want to have enough land to tap down the Soul Canar and draw a card. And you're probably thinking, but you've got Mishra's Workshop. That's right, but I can only use Mishra's Workshop to cast artifacts. So you can tap it for three mana, which is great, but you can only use it to cast artifacts. You cannot use it to activate an artifact or cast any other, uh, you know, any colored spell. So tapping four, tapping six, will we see a trike? Let's see what I'm going to do here. There's a Triskelion. This is wonderful. 4-4. Four, four. It's really great, but I, I think I'd rather just have one more basic land. That would be perfect, because then I can start drawing cards with my GM Dayton. So let's see what's going to happen next. Is he going to turn it into the trike? I'm really happy that the dice is on there, indicating that those are four counters. So that's how I know it's a Clockwork Avian and not the Triskelion or any other thing. So that's really helpful. He's deciding to keep it into a Clockwork Avian. So it's a 4-4 Flyer. Looking at his hand. I mean, he's got more cards in his hand than me, right? Because I've been just playing out a lot of stuff. Tapping down the Sulkanar, the Swamp King. Let's see, what can I do here? What can he do here? He's passing turn. Untapping everything I have. Looking for land still. My deck's really mana hungry. I'm finding an island here. That's actually pretty good. That means I can tap down the Sulkanar and draw a card. So that is good news for me. I guess I can just pass turn. Or maybe I'm going to try to attack. Attacking here with the Clockwork Avian. Offering him a deal. Because I really want to get rid of that Vesuvan Doubleganger. It's just a liability. And remember, with that Vesuvan, he can clone my trike during his upkeep if he wants to, and that kind of prevents me from playing smaller creatures. So I think maybe I shouldn't have played that Triskelion. And this is interesting. Now I'm using my strip mine to take care of the black mana. So that's pretty late, actually. You would expect me to or do that straight away or not do that at all, especially now that I have enough mana to end tap down his Sulkanar and draw a card. So I think this is a little mistake here um, from my side. Then again, I mean, I am canceling out the color black now for Adam. But like I said, I think I should have done that earlier in the game if, if that was going to be my strategy. But anyway, it's done now. And as you can see, I only have three mana that I can use for that book, which is not enough, so I cannot draw a card. And I'm going to untap my Clockwork Avian. As you can see, it has lost a counter, so now I can decide to tap it again and recharge it, deciding not to, finding another island. That's pretty sweet. Attacking with my 3-4, so I'm offering a trade here to Adam, saying, Adam, you can block with your Vesuvan, which is the 4-4 Avian, and then I have to use one of my Triskelion counters, one of my plus one, plus one counters, to kill it. So it's kind of a good deal for you, because you trade a card and I lose a plus one, plus one counter, so it's a better trade, so I'm really offering it here but maybe Adam can think hmm what's in his hand does he have some kind of 1-1 one, one in his hand so this is quite interesting let's see what he's going to do and he's tapping with his hands what can he do he's deciding to block and yeah there's the scenario I talked about so he's going to block take 3 damage and I'm going to use one of the tri counters to deal a final piece of damage. And that means the Vesuvan Doubleganger is dead. And it's actually pretty good for me again because I can use my Icy to tap his Sulkanar still. And I've got four mana left to draw a card with my Jam Day Tome. Finally able to use my Jam Day Tome. That took me long enough. Drawing a card from it. And attacking him right now. So that means he's gonna go to 25. And let's see. Oh, this is important. Taunus's Coffin. Taunus's Coffin is an artifact from Antiquities. I can pay three and tap it to put target creature in the coffin, exile it from the game temporarily, or as long as I keep the coffin tapped. But when I untap the coffin, something special is going to happen. I'm actually going to show it right now. I'm going to tap, put my Triskelion in the coffin. And what's going to happen during my upkeep? I can untap my coffin. And then the Triskelion come back comes back into play on the battlefield and then it triggers again and it gets three additional plus one plus one counters. So what I can actually do is I can constantly put it in the box, out of the box, in the box, out of the box. 
and create a lot of plus one plus one counters. Now remember, I can only untap the coffin, I believe during my upkeep. So it's not like I can put it in the box and decide to untap it instantly and just kind of create tons and tons of counters. It is going to take a lot of turns, but it is a very strong strategy, especially when you're looking at the board state of Adam. I mean, it's just not looking good for him right now. Only have that one Solkanar on the battlefield. And this is quite a good card right now, Apprentice Wizard, because my deck is so mana hungry. Oh, there's a terror on the wizard. There's a spell blast protecting the wizard. That is good news for me. Hopefully. I get to use it and it looks like he's taking a lot of damage here going to 20 attacking with my trike I'm not sure if I could have attacked because I think it comes back into play tapped so I'm not sure if this is correct Anyway, Adam is taking the damage. He's on 20 right now and I think if he should have taken if he would have taken the damage he should be on 21 so it's kind of vague to me what's happening right now. And look at that. He's playing his own Triskelion. And that trike, yeah, ex exactly comes in with three plus one plus one counters. It's a four, four. Anyway, the situation is now as follows. Adam is on 20 and I am on 27. And I just have a lot of permanence. Interesting here is that Adam doesn't decide to kill my apprentice wizard straight away. Maybe he feels that I already have a lot of mana, but the thing is with the Apprentice Wizard, I can pay one blue and tap and it gives me three colorless mana, which is huge in my deck. For example, I can just activate my Taunus's Coffin because of the Apprentice Wizard with only one blue mana and I still have enough mana left to tap one of his creatures down or whatever to use my Icy and to draw a card with my Jam Day Tome. So for me, the Apprentice Wizard is extremely useful. And I think if, if I would have been Adam, I probably would have killed the apprentice on the spot. But let's just, uh, let's take a look. Maybe he has his reasons. I'm on 27. He's on 20. What am I going to do here in this situation? I have a lot of things going for me. I could, of course, attack just with the trike. Could also use choose to put something in the coffin. And it looks like I'm tapping my apprentice wizard here, tapping my workshop, having six mana available now to cast an artifact. There is a Tetravis. Wow, this is pretty sweet. 4-4 four, four Flyer. So it's actually a 1-1 one, one Flyer. Comes into play with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters. This is just crazy. I wish I had more Coffins. Because this you can do the same Coffin trick with the Tetravis. Wow, if you're Adam, I'm sorry. He's just extremely unlucky here. I've got such a good draw. The only thing that's kind of speaking for him is that he's still in a pretty high life total. So putting his Solkanar in the box, again, this kind of is an interesting move. I'm not sure. I think this is not the best move. Anyway, attacking here with my 6-6. Six, six. And what is he going to do now? Tapping 2. Oh, look at that. Casting a Bloodlust. It's a card from Legends. Um, plus 4, minus 4. And the power of the creature, uh, the toughness of the creature cannot go down to one. So it's playing it on his trike. So strike is now becoming an 8-1. I actually think that in response, I can now kill his strike. I wonder if I'm going to do that or if I don't notice it. I think we're having a little discussion here. I'm saying I'm going to take my counters off to kill your trike before that happens, but I don't actually have to do that. This is quite interesting. I think we're having a little discussion what is actually happening. I think the best play for me to do is it turns into an 8-1 because of the Bloodlust. I think what I should do is then use one counter from the trike to kill it before damage is being dealt. But it looks like I'm not doing that instead I'm killing his Triskelion and he's using his plus one plus one counters to deal damage to me. So I'm now on 24 and he is on 19 it seems. Okay, that is really interesting. Again, I'm not really sure if we're playing this correctly. Then again, it's kind of hard to follow when you get these complex board states. He's now playing a Nevenerals Disc, by the way. That means I'm untapping my... Coffin. So the Soul Canar comes back, tapped into play, attacking here with the 4 4. That means he's going to drop to 15. So Adam is now on 15. He's getting pretty low, actually. 
And when I'm looking at my mana and what I can do, remember, I've got that obelisk of undoing. I can use that to, put, to send one of my permanents back to my hand. And I can use my apprentice wizard, tap a blue, get three, tap another three. Then I'll have six mana to activate my obelisk. So I can save one of my permanents. And I also have three left to put one of my creatures in the coffin. So I can basically save a permanent and I can save a creature, which is actually not too bad. So I could save the Tetravus, the 4 4 flyer. And when the coffin is blown up, the Tetravus comes back into play as a 7 7 because it gets additional counters. That's actually not too bad. The thing is, if I use the coffin now, in response, Adam is going to blow his disc. I wonder if I'm going to notice all of this. For some reason, and I don't know if you recognize that, but when I'm looking at a game like this, I know what to do. But when I'm in the game, I sometimes make decisions that I think of, why, why did I do that? So let's see what I'm going to do now with the Nevenrolls disc. I think we're kind of discussing all the options. And I... I man, this it's really an interesting game. But it's hard to commentate with so many elements. So look at this. I'm activating my Apprentice Wizard. I want to put my Tetravus in the coffin. I think this is a bad decision. In response, I, oh, now I remember. I remember this. In response, Adam's going to blow up the disc. I can use my Obelisk to save my Jam Day Tome, which I think is a good decision because it's basically cards, right? But what I should have done is simply keep the board as is and wait till Adam activates his Nevenerals disc. And then I could have used my Taunus' coffin to put my creature in the coffin and save my creature. But okay, I decided not to. At least I can recast my Jam Day Tome and I've got enough mana to draw an extra card or to play my commander. Ooh, look at this. Tapping everything. Brain Geyser. Oh, man. This is such a great comeback for me. Drawing four fresh cards finding a land playing it out passing turn here remember adam's on 15 that may sound like a lot but for a commander game that is not a lot but he's counting his mana that is pretty risky i am still on 24 and he is recasting soul canard the swamp king here five five absolute powerhouse that i will have to deal with let's see if i found something maybe I don't know, control magic or something. There is my Sage of Latinam. So remember, it's an artist proof. Kind of showing here the card that it actually is. And I can, Sage of Latinam is a 1-2 creature. I was showing the other artist proof is a 1-2 is a creature that I can tap to sacrifice an artifact and draw a card. Now, obviously, I'm not going to sacrifice my Tome. So again, I kind of wonder... Is this the way to go? I mean, I'm not sure what else is in my hand. Maybe I just want to have it on the board and then all the other artifacts that I'm going to play that actually get into onto the board. I can always sack it for a card if Adam tries to destroy it in any way. Interesting, interesting game. And it looks like we both have to rebuild here. And um, let me know what you would have done, by the way, because I chose to keep my uh, Jam Day Tome and not, for example, my IC Manipulator. Let me know in the comments below what you would have chosen, what you've chosen, also the Jam Day Tome or the IC Manipulator. And just to clarify, I don't think I had the Brain Geyser in my hand when I had to make that decision. Look at that playing a Maze of If. That is a perfect answer to that Sulkanar. And again, we're in the situation where I can kind of stop the Soul Canar, And because I have the Jam Day Tome, I kind of feel that I'm in the advantage here. Oh, ho, ho! Phantasmal Terrain. Drawing a card to find a counter spell. Finding a Mana Drain. Ho, oh, ho! This is crazy. So he's, he's playing Phantasmal Terrain. In response, I'm deciding to dig for a counter spell and actually finding one. That like never happened. So I'm happy I caught this on camera. Um, so I protected my Maze of If, which is pretty important because of that Soul Canard that's on the board. And let's see what he can do now. It looks like he's going to play some more. Anime Dead, what is he going to bring back? Uh-oh, he's bringing back the Triskelion from my graveyard. Ooh, bad news for me here. And he could use, I mean, he could use to try to kill the Sage. I don't think he's going to do that because the Sage is not 
really a problem here. Using the mana from the mana drain and two islands here to draw a card with the jam day tome. And I think this card advantage, it's, it's really going to help me to find answers to the threats on the board here. Tapping some more mana, it looks like something big is coming. Well, not that, five mana, okay, still big. Air Elemental, four, four flyer. And the good news here for me is that my opponent doesn't have any flyers. And I'm also playing, oh, I forgot the name. It's the Storage Land from uh, Fallen Empire. So it comes into play tapped and every turn I keep it tapped. I always call it the Homerit home. I know that's not the name, but it kind of, when I look at it, I think, okay, this is where the Homerits live, you know, of, of Fallen Empires. Anyway, every turn it gets a storage counter and it kind of builds up. And then you can choose to untap it at any moment. And you can just take all the counters off at once. It's pretty cool. Really nice with Brain Geyser, for example, but I've already played it. Uh, but anyway, it's Adam's turn. Let's see what he's gonna do here. He is a tough customer. Oh, an Immolation, plus two, minus two. He's using it to kill my Sage of Latinum. Interesting choice, because what he could have done, oh, Chain Lightning, and then using the Trike to kill my Air Elemental. So that's why he didn't play it on my uh, on my Air Elemental, that Immolation. Attacking now with both, sending back the Soul Canar, taking uh, three damage here. Actually gonna go down to 21. For some reason, I'm going down to 22. Um, I don't think that makes sense, but okay, 22 it is. You have to understand here these games, um, we're all pretty friendly. I know Adam pretty uh, pretty well, I guess. I mean, not that well, he lives in the States, but uh, we've chatted about Magic a lot of times. He's also a patron of the channel, so it's, it's all very friendly. We discuss a lot of scenarios together. Uh, but I think I should have been on 21, to be honest. But anyway, I'm on 22. Adam is on 15. I am untapping, and I, I am in trouble here. At least I've got the maze. So it could be worse. And I still have my Jam Day Tome to kind of dig for answers. Ghost Ship. That is pretty cool. Two for Flyer from the Dark. For three, I can regenerate it. So that means I can now just block the Trike. That's pretty cool. And more importantly, it's flying, so I can start attacking Adam as well. Remember, Adam is on 15. Pretty interesting, pretty interesting game. And uh, I'm probably not gonna use my Gem Day Tome right now, wanting to keep those three blue open to, uh... oh, <laughs> okay, yeah, I remember. Whenever I'm talking about the dark, there's this weird thing in the dark. You've got Fire Drake, which is two red and one, and it's an uncommon in the dark. And then you've got Ghost Ship, which is two blue and two for a two for a flyer, which is, it's, it's actually quite a good card. You also see it in regular uh, old school tournaments, and it is a common, ladies and gentlemen. So it kind of, it makes no sense to me. So whenever I, I play Ghost Ship, I, um, yeah, I have to, I have to mention that. So anyway, I've played the Ghost Ship. I keep my islands open because I want to regenerate it for three blue. Passing turn here to Adam again. Looks like he's thinking, and that's not a good sign for me because that means he has options. Tapping four here and casting a Dragon Whelp 2-3 Flyer that you can pump. You can give it plus one, plus oh for one red. Really a classic creature. And I'm counting my lands as well. What am I going to do here? Untapping the storage land. Look at the amount of lands I have. It's insane. Am I going to cast Leviathan? Please let me cast Leviathan. Yeah, is it going to come? Really? Oh, it's on the table. Oh, this is so sweet. 10, 10, trample. Oh, ho, ho. <laughs> This is so sweet. And I'm actually pointing out there's a little combo here because I have to sacrifice, I believe, two islands, maybe even three to untap. And then when I attack, um, you know, it stays tapped. But I can use my Mace of If after damage is dealt to untap it. So I really hope that my Leviathan is going to stick to the board at least for one combat. I really hope so. Oh, man, I'm really happy. This is what you want to do, man. You want to cast creatures like this. This is what you want to do in Magic. I don't I don't care about all the other stuff, you know. I'm just happy I cast it 10-10. So I'm on 22, Adam's on 15. He's looking at this huge Leviathan. And he's thinking, I need something to deal with the Leviathan. Tapping it black. 
What is he going to do with that one black mana? What is his plan? Playing a Paralyze. Oh, I was actually hoping that he would do it on, um, on the Leviathan. That would be really sweet. And I can untap it for four. But of course, he's uh, he's too clever for that. Playing it on a Ghost Ship. Ghost Ship gets stabbed. That means I'm in for a lot of damage. Look at that. Playing a Wheel of Fortune. Really sweet. And he's pointing out that he couldn't play his Sengir Vampire or Underworld Dreams because he didn't have enough black mana. And of course, that Underworld Dreams with Wheel of Fortune. Wow, that is quite a nice combo. He could have done seven damage to me in one go. But I mean, look at the situation now. I'm all open, so he can attack me with everything he has. I'm probably going to use my Maze on the Sulkanar. And oh, Stone Rain on Maze of If. Can I counter this? If I can't, then I'm in for a lot of I'm in for a lot of damage. That's the conclusion of today, ladies and gentlemen. He's gonna attack here. Five, seven, ten damage. I mean, I'm assuming he's gonna do that. Why would he hold back? The only thing he's gotta worry for is that crazy big 10-10 Leviathan. Okay, that's a good point. But still, I mean, it's got trample. He's deciding not to attack. And now I have to decide, am I going to untap my Leviathan? And attack with it. I'm, oh, I'm doing it. Untapping Leviathan. Sacking two islands. Using uh, two of those islands, by the way, to untap my ghost ship. Oh, this is so sweet. This is so sweet. Playing War Barge. I can give it Island Walk. And he cannot block it. Pay two. Oh, <laughs> come on, do it. Oh, man, playing a, is that a Fountain of Youth, right? From the dark, I can gain one life, ladies and gentlemen, by tapping two mana. I know, it's pretty cool. Oh, this is so cool. I'm going to do it. Going to give it Island Walk, and I'm going to swing in for 10. And that means my opponent is going to drop to five life. Oh, this feels so, so good. This feels so good. I mean, you build a deck and you have these crazy ideas of what if, what if, what if, what if. And you know when you're when you're brewing like a Timmy, it usually never works. But look at this. Look at this. It's beautiful and it's working. I'm sorry, Adam. I'm just really happy that it's working. And I think what Adam now needs, at least he has a full hand. I, he just needs to get rid of that Leviathan, especially now that it's un, unblockable. Because he can give it Island Walk with the War Barge. And, um, I mean, he's on five now. Is this the last turn of Adam, or can he actually do something to save himself here? Tapping three. Oh! No! Oh! Ashes to ashes. That means he can remove two of my creatures. But he does have to take five damage. He's not dead. I thought he was on five. Oh, he gains life, of course, because of the Soul Canar. And he's played Black Spell. So he was not on 15. He was on 19. And he's actually going to drop to four here. So I apologize. It's, of course, he gains life every time a Black Spell is being cast. He gains one life. So the Soul Canar is kind of keeping him in the game here. I believe he's on four right now. And he's attacking me with everything he has wow he's dealing tons of damage i'm dropping here to 13 and now he's playing oh that's um wait a minute that's um gauntlet gauntlet of chaos what it does five to cast five and tap there's a four spike he can pay one so unfortunately for me the four spike is not going to do much well i mean he's tapped out that's the only thing so he can't counter anything next turn. I guess that's why I did it. Taking a life with my fountain, going to 14. Uh, so Gauntlet of Chaos, he can pay five and sacrifice. And then he can change, I think, target land, artifact, or creature. And then he has to give me something back. So I do see a copy artifact here. I'm copying the Gauntlet of My, a Gauntlet of Chaos. Gauntlet of Might is not a card, sorry. Gauntlet of Chaos. It's a card from Legends, by the way. It's quite, quite crazy. So I'm casting it first. In response, he's going to remove his trike because he doesn't want me to copy the trike. So he's going to deal one damage to me and one damage to the trike, killing itself. 
So I'm on 13. And the way copy artifact works, it's in the game, I can no longer choose to try because it's dead because he killed it on response. So I have to choose a new artifact. And I think I remember that I picked the Gauntlet of Might. And I'm curious now what I'm going to do. This is so incredibly tricky here. So I've got the Gauntlet of Might. My opponent's got a Gauntlet of Might. <laughs> Remember, Gauntlet of Might is five to activate. So I, I guess I can activate it and steal his Gauntlet of Might because he's tapped out. That's an option. Ooh, Winter Orb. This is brutal. Winter Orb means that during the upkeep, each player can only untap one land. So that means it's going to be really difficult for Adam to use his Gauntlet. Whoa, this is intense. What am I going to do next here? So I've got the five there for the gauntlet. Guess deciding not to do it. Instead, what am I going to do here? Looking at my hand. This is such a complex game. If I'm correct, I believe Adam is on four, and I'm trying to look at his dice, trying to see if that is a four there. I do believe it's a four. Tapping three here. I'm on 13, tapping four mana. What am I going to do with four mana? Control magic, perhaps? Steal artifact? What am I going to do here? Control magic, okay. What am I going to steal? Okay, stealing a soul canar. Tapping two more. Oh, this is nice playing uh, the Merfolk Assassin. So Merfolk Assassin is a card from the Dark 1-2 Merfolk. Tap, destroy target creature with Island Walk. And I'm also playing with the War Barge. So I've got this classical combo on the board. So that is pretty nice. So I can kill the Dragon Whelp next turn. But of course, if Adam, Adam can attack, but he doesn't want to, because then he dies, because I can attack him with the Solkanar, but I can give Solkanar Swamp Walk. I think it's it's over for Adam unless he can kill the Soul Canar. He has to kill the Soul Canar or do something with the Control Magic. Now we're not playing with white. And he can only untap one land because of that annoying Winter Orb. Well, annoying for him is fantastic for me, of course. I do believe... War Barge, is it three to activate to give Island Walk? I believe it's three, but I can untap a land and then I have enough mana. Adam is looking at his hand, he's swinging in. I'm going to 11. And I think this is it. Okay, it looks like he's pumping it up. So I'm actually going to 10, playing a Swamp here. And passing turn, I'm going to untap. Am I going to go for the win? I'm going to attack. And that's it. Ho <laughs> ho! Right? I think that's game. And it looks like we're discussing it now. Um, and yeah, I do believe that's game. We're looking at our cards. It's kind of unclear, but yeah, this is game. Wow, man. Uh, this has been very intense. Uh, Adam, I really want to thank you for this game. This was your idea uh, to do this. Uh, and I'm happy that you came up with the idea. Thank you for bringing such an awesome and flavorful deck to, uh, to Timmy Talks. And I would also like to thank all of you for watching another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. I know it was hard to follow from time to time. Um, I'm sorry for that. Also with the life total, it's, it's pretty difficult. Um, let me know in the comments uh, comments below if, it, if you have any questions about the match. I do believe we made a few mistakes here and there. And also I could have made some different uh, decisions. But man, this was an interesting match. A great match to look back at. A great match for myself personally to play. Just swinging in with a Leviathan. You know, that's... That, <sighs> That's kind of the dream, you know. That's that's what you want to do when you when you put it in the deck. How often can you actually attack with a Leviathan? I'm just uh, I'm just really really over the moon um, with this uh, with this attack and with this match. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for watching another episode of Timmy Talks. And if you want to support the channel, 
Um, you can do so by leaving a like, uh, subscribing to the channel if you're not a subscriber yet, clicking the notification bell, that really help, helps. YouTube finds that super important, so I guess I find it really important. Uh, leave a comment, like I said before, let me know what you think of the game. What could I improve? Uh, where did things go wrong? If you have any, any questions, if you have a compliment, man, give compliments, always welcome. Um, yeah, that's about it. Oh yeah, you can also support the channel by becoming a patron on Timmy Talk's Patreon page. Yes, I have a Patreon pa page, ladies and gentlemen. And actually, Adam, the player I was playing uh, against, is one of my patrons. Um, so you can check it out, you can click on there, and you can find out how you can become a patron and how you can support the channel and join Timmy Talks events and also enjoy our Discord community. Um, for now, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at the fantastic, amazing, beautiful channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Ik het dus vind het dus zomaar gezien.